My lords, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, a huge, huge welcome uh, to this year's Courage in Journalism Award. Uh, my name is Philippa Stroud and I am the CEO of the Legatum Institute. And um, this award that we are presenting tonight is really precious to all the team at the Legatum Institute. It was created in memory of the mother of one of our staff me members. And uh, you will hear that story uh, as the evening uh, progresses. And it was also created to honor the courage of journalists around the world who are exercising that courage on a daily basis. And tonight we're going to remember and celebrate journalists who gave their life to tell the truth and to hold those in power to account. And we're also going to hear from journalists who are still themselves displaying that very same courage on a daily basis. But for some of you here tonight, I'm aware that this is your first experience of the Legatum Institute. And so just to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, we were created, um, or we exist, to create pathways from poverty to prosperity for individuals, communities and nations. And we do that by focusing all of our work on building open economies, empowered people and inclusive societies. And we track this through our annual uh, publication, the Legatum Prosperity Index, which charts the growth and decline of prosperity in 147, 49 countries around the world. One of the themes that runs through the index is that of freedom, measured by our freedom pillar. And one aspect of that freedom is press freedom, which we have measured and tracked for over a decade now. And uh, whilst prosperity is increasing and rising around the world, press freedom is declining consistently and has declined consistently over the last decade. And one statistic that always surprises me is that only 13%, 13, 13, 1, 3% of the world's population enjoys a free press. But another of our initiatives um, at the Legatum Institute is our character series, which aims to promote and champion aspects of character. And just last week, we had the privilege of hosting Lord Dubbs here, who spoke on the character trait of compassion. And through the series, we've had a wide range of lectures where the speakers have discussed aspects of character. And what I find so interesting is when we approach speakers and we say to them, which character trait would you like to speak on? Often they say courage. It is obvious that people want to be known and identify with courage. So this event tonight brings together the work of our prosperity index and our freedom pillar. It brings together and adds in the work of our character series and it celebrates freedom of the press. A couple of years ago, I was visiting the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. And inscribed in the marble are the words, freedom is not free. And tonight we want to remember the lives of those who in the last year alone have paid the ultimate price for that freedom. As you will hear this evening, this award was born out of tragedy. But through this initiative, we hope to create something good and something positive. And uh, we're just really grateful that each and every one of you has come this evening to celebrate with us and to remember and honor the lives of those who've given their lives for uh, freedom. And I'm going to hand to Nathan Gamester. If any of you know Nathan, you will know he's the most incredible man. We couldn't run this institute without him. He is multi-talented, but he has created this award and this event tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Nathan Gamester, who is going to be your host for the evening. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Philippa, thank you. Um, how to follow that introduction. Um, no, I'd like to add uh, my welcome uh, to Philippa's. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here this evening uh, to be part of an initiative that is obviously very close to our hearts at Legatum, but also which is very important globally. Um, sadly, the importance of this issue was brought sharply into focus just 11 days ago when the journalist Lyra McKee was shot and killed <coughs> during rioting in Derry. I'm sure many of us watched the coverage of her funeral and thought what a tragic and utterly avoidable loss that was. I think, actually, Theresa May summed it up well uh, when uh, she described Lyra's death as shocking and truly senseless and described her as having died doing her job with great courage. This is an evening of, I think, mixed emotions. On the one hand, we're honouring and also mourning the loss of so many talented journalists who have died too young and often in very difficult circumstances. But on the other hand, our task is to also celebrate their legacy and amplify their impact. And I want to start by telling you the story of how and why we decided to start the Courage in Journalism Award. I was sat at my kitchen table one evening in mid-October 2017, and I went to the BBC News website and saw the first report of the death of Daphne Karuna Galizia, the well-known Maltese journalist. The report stated that she had been murdered near her home in Malta when a bomb had detonated in her car. Naturally, I was horrified by the murder itself, but the feeling was amplified because Daphne's son, Paul, had been a colleague and a friend of ours here at the Institute. I'm delighted to say that Paul is here this evening as well. Um, what I'm trying to say is this felt very close to home. The more information that emerged about Daphne's death, the clearer it became that she was killed directly because of her work as a journalist. And we wanted to do something in response, something to help. In a recent article about his mother, Paul wrote this. She never betrayed a confidence even when her life was under threat. It was this and a capacity for outrage at injustice that she never lost that made my mother Malta's moral conscience. In Malta, everyone read Daphne. Our surname was redundant. In a country of 475,000 people, her website received 400,000 unique visitors a day, more than a million during election campaigns, and a greater number than the combined readership of all Malta's dailies. The last time my mother left her house, she barely made it out of the lane when the bomb under her seat was detonated, flinging her Peugeot with her inside into a nearby field. The car then exploded into a ball of flames. That spot now marks where Malta's most famous journalist, my mother, was assassinated aged 53 on the 16th of October 2017 at 3 p.m. <coughs> Not far from this room in Green Park is a memorial on which the inscription reads, freedom is the sure possession of those who have the courage to defend it. That courage to defend freedom was shown clearly in the life of Daphne Karuna Galizia and is shown in the lives of the many journalists we are honouring this evening. As Philippa mentioned earlier, freedom has always been a strong theme running through our work here. Our annual index, as Philippa mentioned, measures media freedom and tracks its progress over time. There is a tendency to think that the big trends of human progress are all moving in the right direction, and in many cases, they are. Over the course of just a few generations, the prevalence of many infectious diseases, such as smallpox and polio, have declined dramatically or been entirely eradicated. We are now living longer and healthier lives than ever before. In general, the world is more democratic and less autocratic. There are fewer people in poverty than ever before. But on the issue of press, press freedom, <coughs> the trend is moving entirely in the other direction. The graph on the screen shows the global <coughs> average score for press freedom over the past 15 years. This is taken from our prosperity index, which covers 149 countries. Of those 149 countries, 97 have experienced a decline in press freedom in the past decade. In addition to that, the most recent report from, on media freedom from Freedom House states that global press freedom has declined to its lowest point in 13 years. And so against this backdrop, it felt natural, a natural step for us to start this initiative. And in November 2017, we inaugurated the Courage in Journalism Award with the aim of doing three things. Firstly, in honoring Daphne's legacy, Secondly, in shining a light on the dangers facing journalists around the world. And thirdly, in promoting press freedom. And after making this decision, we then set about deciding 
uh, how to structure the award and who would be eligible for its consideration. The truth is that courageous journalism is happening all the time. In fact, there are many courageous journalists in this room tonight. But as we surveyed the various awards and honours that exist for journalists, we started to wonder if we should have, as our focus, journalists who had lost their lives in the course of doing their job. And given that the starting point for this award was the death of a journalist, we felt that this was appropriate. Journalism can be a dangerous profession. In some places, reporting the news can result in persecution and imprisonment, and sadly, it can also result in death. And so we decided to make this award a posthumous award, to recognise a journalist whose life and death had made a significant impact. But of course, our aim was not just to single out a single person. For reasons that are obvious, with this award, there is no winner. In the process of identifying one final recipient, our aim is to bring attention to the many. And so we set about researching the issue. Our research uncovered 70 journalists who had died during the roughly one year period that we covered. The vast majority of these were killed in individual attacks. However, there were some multiple deaths. For example, on the 30th of April 2018, almost exactly one year ago today, nine journalists were among 26 people killed in Kabul when two suicide bombers detonated their explosive devices in a cafe known to be popular with journalists. The bombers on that occasion had disguised themselves as media workers in order to get as close as possible to journalists and to cause maximum harm. From those 70 journalists on our list, Afghanistan was the country in which most deaths occurred, followed by Syria, Mexico, and then India. We then prepared biographies of each of the journalists reviewing as much information as we could about their work, their lives, and the circumstances surrounding their deaths. I want to add here that we owe a huge debt to the Committee to Protect Journalists for their outstanding work that they do uh, to document journalists' deaths and for the relentless campaigning on issues related to media freedom. A huge amount of the information we gathered was taken from the CPJ database. The biographies that we created were uh, originally for the benefit of our judges to provide them with all the information that they would need to create a shortlist and ultimately choose a final recipient. But we've subsequently decided to make these biographies uh, uh, public as we believe that they are a valuable resource for those working on issues of press freedom. And the whole document is available on our website for anybody who wishes to access it. Uh, this brings me on to our incredible judges. And I'm hugely thankful to each of them for their time, effort and dedication that they've brought to this process. We were very clear at the start that we wanted, to, uh, we wanted a judging panel to be comprised of people who understand what it's like being out there as a journalist in some of the most challenging environments. And we certainly got that. I want to give you a sense of why we chose these six. So let me give you an insight into some of their work. Abir Sadi is a war correspondent with close to 30 years' experience in conflict zones covering the Middle East and Africa in countries such as Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Sudan, and Syria. Abir trains journalists to prepare them ahead of work in war-torn regions. Every time Abir and I have exchanged emails over the last couple of months, she seems to be darting from one dangerous place to another, training a new crop of journalists for work in conflict zones. Christina Lam is the Sunday Times' chief foreign correspondent and best-selling author. She's won 14 major awards, including being named Foreign Correspondent of the Year on five separate occasions. Think of a difficult place in the world, and the chances are Christina has reported from there. She was made an OBE in 2013, and I'm delighted to say that later this evening, Christina is going to give some keynote remarks for us this evening. Con Cochlin is the Telegraph's defence editor and chief foreign affairs columnist. He's also a world-renowned expert on the Middle East, he writes, on, he writes on a wide spectrum of topics within the defense and foreign policy space. His book, Saddam, His Rise and Fall, was a New York Times bestseller. Lord Freud, as far as I can work out, has had three successful careers. As a journalist in finance and then also in politics. As a journalist, he worked at the Financial Times for eight years, where he wrote the Lex column. Since then, he's advised the Labour Party on welfare policy. And in 2010, joined the coalition government as a Minister of State for Welfare Reform. Kate Clark is the co-director of the Afghanistan Analyst Network, a policy and research organization which aims to drive good policy making and to increase understanding of realities in Afghanistan. In 99, Kate was the BBC's Kabul correspondent, the only Western journalist based in the country at the time. 
And finally, Mike Thompson is the BBC World Affairs correspondent. You'll frequently hear Mike's reports on the Today programme, on the BBC News website and elsewhere across the BBC. Just recently, Mike was reporting from Idlib, and the reason he can't be here tonight is because he is currently in Khartoum covering the uprising there. It's really been a genuine pleasure to work with this six over the past few months. In just a moment, um, David Freud is going to tell us a little bit more about the judging process. But before that, I wonder if you would be kind enough to join me in thanking our judges for their involvement in this award. Before David comes to the stage to say a few words on behalf of the judges, I'm going to show a short video. This is designed to give you an overview of the Courage in Journalism Award. The video shows the names and images of all of the journalists we considered for the, for the award. And we wanted to do this to commemorate and honour all of them. Towards the end, the video moves from several images on screen to single images. These are some of our shortlisted nominees for whom we wanted to provide some additional detail. Let's play that video now. I wonder if you'd join me in welcoming David Freud to the stage. I've done my share of unpleasant jobs in my time, but this really is, without doubt, the most unpleasant one. I was one of the judges tasked with deciding uh, who, should, who, sh who deserved this award, uh, the Courage in Journalism Award. And the numbers, as you could see there, are horrific. Uh, we looked through no fewer than 70 different murders, 
covering the, the period from July 2017 to September 2018. And one could not help but be overwhelmed by the sheer volume of murderous accounts. And the other abiding impression was the extraordinary bravery which the journalist showed as they went about their everyday task of finding out what was really going on in their chosen area of investigation. Some countries are clearly lethal for journalists. There were no fewer than 16 murders in Afga Afghanistan. More than half of those took place in a single suicide bomber attack, which, we, which Nathan talked about. Twelve were killed in Syria. And given that these two are war zones, maybe that's not surprising. More worrying, more disturbing, are the deaths in Mexico and India. We looked at 12 deaths in Mexico and eight in India. The common theme for many of these murders seem to be uh, local corruption in, in both countries. My fellow judges um, were, were Kate Clark here, you saw them on the screen, Con Coughlin, who's Khartoum, Christina Lamb, who will be following, uh, Abir Sadi here, uh, and Mike Thompson also not here. Um, so we sifted the 70 cases down to a long list of 24, and then we managed to shorten it down to 13. And that shortlist contained three journalists from Mexico, three from India. And the other countries who are in this list of shame were Afghanistan, Brazil, the Philippines, Slovakia, and Syria. One of the things that the judges registered was the bravery of some of the female journalists. We were particularly struck by Leslie Ann Montenegro from Mexico, who was shot by two gunmen in a restaurant after receiving death threats in the previous months. Another formidable woman was Lowry, sorry, Gowri Lankesh, uh, who was based in Bangalore, India. She, again, another shooting. She was highly critical of uh, right-wing extremism. But our job was to select one individual, and we decided on a number of criterion to, criteria to do that. Firstly, the journalist was targeted specifically. This ruled out quite a few who were doing their job, doing their work in areas of danger. The group of nine murdered by the suicide bomber in Afghanistan would be one example of this. One of those journalists uh, was Shah Marai, who, who you saw there, the chief photographer for Agence France Presse, who said when someone uh, tried to persuade him from going to that site on that day, taking photos is more important than my life. The second criteria was the, that the journalist was working on a particular story, and a big story. They had to be performing the core role of, of investigative journalism, uncovering corruption and wrongdoing. This ruled out people like Gowri Lankesh, whose murder seems to have been triggered by her opinion pieces rather than because of a specific investigation. Thirdly, the journalist had to know the risks he or she was undertaking. They had to have received specific threats and decided to continue their investigation anyway. This is, after all, an award for courage in journalism. These people displayed the highest type of bravery, particularly in countries where the murder of journalists is commonplace. 
And then the final criterion was impact. This award, after all, is inspired by the example of Daphne Caruana Galizia, murdered in a car bomb in Malta, which had widespread repercussions. Impact is a somewhat subjective criterion. The murder of the award winner could have registered profoundly in his or her region or country. It could have sparked other journalists to complete the work of their dead colleague. Or just possibly we, the judges, might decide that the allocation of this award to a particular individual might of itself serve to create the right shockwave. In the event, the judges focused in quite rapidly on two individual journalists. I should, of course, leave the winner for the formal announcement. But I should mention the runner-up, Christopher Iban Lozada, who was a radio broadcaster in, in, the, in the southern Philippines. He received multiple threats ahead of the murder, including one from the local mayor of Bislig, who's called Liberador Navarro, who warned him, leave Bislig if you do not want to die. Like so many others in this terrible list, he was ambushed on his drive home, shot multiple times by an unidentified gunman and declared dead at the scene. So not something to celebrate, but something to remember. Thank you. Thank you. David, thank you um, for that. Uh, it's now time to announce the recipient of the uh, Courage in Journalism Award. As we've just heard from David, the task of whittling this list down uh, from the many worthy nominees uh, was a near impossible one. But I am honoured to announce that the recipient of this year's Courage in Journalism Award is Jan Kuciak. Jan was an investigative reporter for the Slovakian news website Actuality SK. His investigations included looking at allegations of tax fraud associated with individuals close to the Social Democrat Party. He had also been working on investigations into an Italian mafia group, specifically at their connection with politicians in Slovakia. On the 25th of February 2018, he was found shot dead alongside his fiancée, Martina Kusnerova in their home. Both Jan and Martina were 27 at the time of their death. After his death, prosecutors stated they believed Kusiak was killed to stop his investigation. It's clearly a tragic case and very and, and deeply sad. Not only did it involve the death of a journalist, but also of his fiancée too. But one of the reasons Jan was selected by the judges was because of the impact he has had following his and Martina's death. It's no understatement to say that the impact and the subsequent events it set in motion have been huge. Less than a month after his death, tens of thousands of Slovaks took to the streets to demand the resignation of the then Prime Minister Robert Fico and an end to corruption and sleaze. The protests continued in Bratislava and around the country for many months following Kusiak's murder which ultimately led to the resignation of Prime Minister Fico and several of his cabinet. And just a few weeks ago, Slovakia's new president was sworn in, Jana Chaputova, the country's first female head of state. During her campaign, Ms. Chaputova cited Jan Kuciak's murder as one of the reasons she decided to run for president. And it's worth noting that one of the key policies that, uh, during the campaign was that of being pro-freedom of the press. In terms of the investigation into Jan's murder, last month authorities in Slovakia charged Marian Kochner, one of Slovakia's richest men, with having ordered Kuciak's murder. Jan Kuciak had previously received telephone, threatening telephone calls from Marian Kochner, which he had reported to the police, but his complaint was dismissed. And so we continue to watch as that case continues in the hope that justice will be served uh, to those responsible. Now, at this point in the evening, I was 
uh, hoping to welcome to the stage Martin Turcek, a colleague of Jan Kusiak's, who was planning to fly over from Slovakia to accept the award on Jan's behalf. However, over the weekend, Martin contacted us to say that he'd fallen ill and was too unwell to travel. But Martin has kindly sent us a video message expressing his thanks and to say a few words about Jan, and in particular about his legacy. Martin was a colleague of Jan's, working on some of the same investigations and partnering with him right up until his death. So let's play that video now. Good evening from Slovakia. I'm sorry to miss the opportunity to meet you all in person due to illness. Therefore, I only say a few words via a video recorded from my bed. First, let me thank the Legatum Institute for awarding Jan Kuciak with the Courage in Journalism Award. We in Actuality SK appreciate it greatly, and I'm sure Jan deserves the honor. Jan already moved Slovak society greatly, even in his young age. He was only 27 years old when he was brutally murdered along with his fiancée, Martina, in February 2018. Jan was an investigative reporter, constantly looking for problems in Slovak society and governance. Jan was able to do this all mostly thanks to public data, publicized information, and various open sources. He wrote dozens of stories about tax fraud, connections between oligarchs and politicians, and about misuse of government funds. Biggest portions of Jan's stories were about a tax fraudster and a very symbol of corruption in Slovakia ever since the 90s, person of name Marian Kochner. Jan wrote over 20 st investigative stories on shady businesses of this mobster. In multiple cases that Jan uncovered, Marian Kochner is now facing charges. In the past, powerful people did not face charges in Slovakia, but Jan's precise work that reminds the work of a police investigator was one of the reasons for tipping these scales. His findings about shady illegal businesses could not be ignored by the police anymore, and quite opposite, led police to open case files and started to present problems to the powerful. Even though Jan worked on the stories that were not usually positive or cheerful, Jan was always in good spirits. He was a very thoughtful and helpful person. He loved his work and he was very idealistic. For me, it was very inspiring to work with him. I was very glad that I was able to team up with him in January 2018, even though it lasted for only a brief two months until he was murdered. After Jan was murdered, the whole of Slovak society stood up against the corruption that Jan was writing about. Actually, it was the corruption that led to Jan's and Martina's death. After the murder, people became a lot more courageous in their support for journalists, whether it was attending the most massive protests in the last 30 years in Slovakia, or sending great amount of tips for new investigative stories, even if they'd risk their own career. Protests in the streets led to partial political change in Slovakia. Now the country has a different prime minister, different couple of new ministers, and also as a direct result of Jan's last unfinished article. Two former PM's close colleagues had to step down after Jan linked them to Slovak branch of Italian mafia called Dranketa. Also, as a result of Jan's murder and subsequent investigation, high-ranking officials from the prosecution and the police had to step down, including the former police president. Thanks to Jan, we are living in a better country now, but we still wait for a significant change of what was the heart of Jan's work, a system of corrupt deals and political cronyism. First few months after Jan's murder were, were very hard, and not just emotionally. We wanted to trust the police, they will do everything they can to punish those responsible for his murder. But we didn't know if they are able to find them. Suddenly, in fall 2018, police arrested four suspects of the murder. They are in jail ever since, and police is still piling evidence against these people. Currently, five people are charged for Jan's murder, beginning with two perpetrators through two middlemen, all the way up to the top 
and to the probable mastermind of the murder, which is Marian Kochner, the same businessman Jan was writing most of his stories about. He is now in jail, also thanks to Jan's work. Kochner was charged with ordering the murder just a month ago. At this point, I'd like to thank the investigators and the police responsible for this case, for their hard work done in order to bring justice for Jan, Martina, their families, and the whole country. Of course, justice doesn't change the fact that Jan is no longer with us and we miss him. However, his work will never disappear. And as far as possible, we, his friends and colleagues, will continue and expand when Jan started. And let everyone know that not even a murder of a journalist can silence the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, thank you ever so much. I know you will soon be watching the video of this event, so let me just say to you on behalf of everybody at the Legatum Institute and everybody in this room, we are so grateful to you for taking the time to record that video and also for your courage expressed through your reporting. So thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome Christina Lam, OBE, to the stage. I've already done the formal introduction, and so I will be very brief. Uh, Christina is the award-winning uh, Chief Foreign Correspondent for the Sunday Times, and she's going to speak to us about why freedom of the press and courageous journalism is important for society. Let's welcome Christina. Thank you very much. Um, somewhat ironically, I came here from doing an interview at the BBC this afternoon um, in a programme where we were discussing um, courage in journalism and war reporters. And we just started the programme when the fire alarm went off. <laughs> so we all assumed it was just a, a drill. Um, we dutifully marched outside and it was in fact an actual fire at the BBC, <laughs> um, which prompted some amusement, the idea that uh, having gone there to talk about bravery in war zones that we might have ended up burnt <laughs> in the BBC, I suppose shows that danger can be anywhere. Um, it's a very poignant time to be doing these awards, I think. Um, Philippa mentioned um, the death last week of Lyra uh, McKee, and I guess like many of you here, I couldn't really believe last Wednesday that I was watching the funeral of a British journalist in the UK in 2019. Um, especially one who was clearly as bright and brilliant as Lyra was. And I think in some ways all the warm and wonderful tributes to her and her own lyrical words that some of you may have read subsequently just make the waste even more deeply sad. Now, Lyra, of course, was caught up in something rather than being killed because of her work but she was there because of what she does. And that work was immensely courageous. And I think her death, a stark reminder really of how this job has changed and become much more dangerous. Like David, I have to say this is the most depressing award I have ever been involved in judging. I mean, you literally have to be dead to make the list. Um, and you know, how do you choose? How is one death more worthy than another? Um, all I can say is, you know, all of these people were incredibly courageous and inspiring. And it was very grim just to see the length of the list. I mean, 70 names and the number of countries, we, as you saw um, there, from Afghanistan to Mexico, Palestine to Somalia, Brazil to India. Oh, so many journalists on assignment being shot in the back, blown up by suicide bombs or car bombs. And to me, it seems I've been doing this job now 32 years. You can work out how old I must be. <laughs> um, and two things have changed dramatically in that time. One of them is a good thing, which is communications. When I started out, there was no such thing as mobile phones or internet. Um, when I speak to students and talk to them about sending copy by telex, or uh, they look at me, has clearly no idea what I'm talking about. Um, 
And so, you know, now we can send stories literally from anywhere, which has made the job much easier in many ways. But the other thing that has changed a lot, which is a bad thing, is it has become much more dangerous. When I started out in the late 80s, uh, most of my colleagues that were killed um, were in car accidents or plane crashes, really through terrible bad luck, occasionally because somebody had done something stupid. We were not targeted because of what we did. And what's changed since 9-11 is that we are, we've become the front line. Many uh, terrorists, insurgents would rather kill a journalist than a soldier because it means bigger headlines. I remember that in 2001, I was with a colleague, a photographer called Justin Sutcliffe, and we were abducted from our hotel room in Quetta in the middle of the night. Um, and we were held for three days by Pakistani intelligence, ISI. It never occurred to us really then to be scared. We just thought it was incredibly irritating because we <laughs> wanted to be reporting. Now, um, a month after that, Danny Pearl from the Wall Street Journal was also abducted in Pakistan and, um, as you know, ended up in a video with a knife um, cutting his head off. And that was the first journalist to be beheaded by Al-Qaeda. I think the danger was brought home to me, particularly in a very personal way, six years ago, uh, when my colleague Marie Colvin, who I'm sure you've heard about, was killed in Homs covering the war in Syria. As we've heard, last year was the deadliest year for journalists. Um, for some reason, the figures seem to vary depending who you talk to. So according to the Foreign Office, 99 journalists were killed, 348 detained and 60 taken hostage by non-state groups. Um, according to the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, at least 54 journalists died violently, 34 of them murdered in direct retaliation for their work. We tend, I think, here to focus on foreign correspondents and the dangers that they face going to places. But the greatest risks are being taken by local journalists. And many of them are earning a pittance. We heard about that um, suicide bombing where nine Afghan journalists were killed last year. Most of these people were earning just $10 a day. And when they're killed, their families are left destitute. There's no, none of this sort of insurance and things that we all have. So I'm particularly keen that we should remember those people. And not all the journalists that were killed last year were covering conflict. Um, the alarming reality of modern journalism is that war zones are far from the most dangerous place for journalists to be. Um, most horrific, I think, of all the murders last year of journalists was that of Jamal Khashoggi, um, the Saudi journalist who was tortured and then dismembered in his country's embassy in Istanbul. And that was by, as we know, assassins linked to the crown prince. As we saw on our list, one of the worst places continues to be Mexico. And you might have seen the picture uh, when we had all the pictures at the beginning of um, a woman with big round glasses. <laughs> that was Pamela Montenegro, who was referred to earlier. And she was known as La Nana Pelucas, the grandma in week wigs. <laughs> and she made satirical vi videos. And actually, if you look at her work, in many ways, she seems to have made no greater offence, really, than, than um, mocking local politicians. But she lived in Acapulco, which is the centre of fighting between different drug cartels, and clearly, sense of humour has been dulled over the years. And, and there she was in the restaurant that she owned with her husband when two men approached and shot her in the face and stomach. As we've seen, like our winner, others were exposing corruption. I found it alarming the number of them that were in India, which is not a country that I had really associated so much with murders of journalists. Um, you may also be familiar with the case recently uh, in February in Ghana of Ahmed Hussein Sawal de Villa, an investigative reporter who worked for the BBC. And he got a call one day to say that his child was sick 
Uh, and as he drove to um, to where his charge should be in his home north of Accra, he was ambushed as he slowed down and he was killed. Now, he was best known for his expose of football corruption in Ghana. Um, because of his work, there was a lifetime ban on the former head of the country's football association and several referees. Um, he had actually told the CPJ last year that he feared for his life. And as we've seen, not all of these killings were in developing countries. The last few years has seen a worrying series of killings in Europe. Of course, we talked about Daphne Caruana Galicia, uh, who was killed in October 2017. Um, and then our brave young winner tonight, Jan Kubicek from Slovakia and so young to, to have died. And the vast majority of these murders are committed with impunity. Even if lower level arrests are made, the masterminds behind these attacks are almost never identified and prosecuted. UNESCO recently calculated that 1,010 journalists had been killed between 20, 2006 and 2017, but only one in nine cases had led to convictions. Nor is it just killing that threatens the media. In Turkey, more than 150 journalists are in jail as we speak. Pakistan, which is a country I've spent a lot of time in, I was just with a journalist colleague earlier today, and it is seeing the worst censorship since the strictest times of military rule in the 1980s. Journalists there are regularly picked up and beaten, the military has a troll factory which puts out abuse and threats on social media if they write about the military and its patronage of jihadi groups or interference in politics. Um, most of them end up with their names placed on something called the exit control list so they cannot travel outside the country. We should remember that for many reporters around the world, this is everyday occurrence, death threats issued anonymously via social media. Freedom House reports that only 13% of the world's population lives in a country with genuinely free press. 45% of the population lives in a media environment that they classify as not free. And as we saw earlier, global press freedom has declined to its lowest point in 13 years. So why does all this matter? Well, I think in an era when many politicians around the world have profited from depicting the mainstream media as a pack of unprincipled liars, I would argue that the role of the press is more important than ever. What kind of example is being set when the leader of the free world describes what he calls the fake news media as the true enemy of the people? Thomas Jefferson famously mused that he'd rather have newspapers without a country than a country without newspapers. And that's for good reason. An independent press ensures that citizens stay informed about the actions of their government, creating a forum for debate and the open exchange of ideas. And the press has another critical role as a watchdog to enable the public to hold their representatives accountable. But if people don't believe that the mainstream media can be trusted, then they won't believe journalists if they punish evidence of corruption or illegal activity by the government. There may be different versions of truth, but there are facts. And that's what good journalism is about uncovering, however uncomfortable for those in power. Never before in my lifetime has there been such a tendency to blame the messenger. Even in well-established liberal democracies, we are finding we can no longer take democracy or free press and free speech for granted. In America, papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post have reacted by stepping up their reporting. Time magazine last year named a group of murdered and inspired journalists as its 2018 Person of the Year. The Foreign Office in this country has also made protecting journalists a priority with a two-day conference on the issue planned um, in July in London. I think some of us are a little bit sceptical about this given that most journalists, when they get in trouble in foreign countries and they're British, think that they're better off contacting just about any other embassy than the British. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> let's keep an open mind about it. <laughs> um, but bearing witness does matter. 
about 10 years ago, I went through a period where I'd had a series of narrow escapes, one after another. I'd been ambushed by the Taliban in Helmand. I was in a hotel that was suicide bombed, and I was on Benazir Bhutto's bus when it was blown up. And as I washed off other people's blood and burnt flesh in the shower after that, I wondered if it was time to give up, whether it was really worth it. Not so much really because of the danger, but because of the feeling that the reporting wasn't actually making any difference. And the night I got back from that trip, I went for dinner, not far from here actually, that the Bar Council in, had organised in honour of a really brave um, Zimbabwean human rights lawyer called Beatrice Matetwa. And I said to her, I'd been, Zimbabwe is one of the countries I've gone to a lot, and for a long while we were banned as um, British journalists and we were going undercover, which meant that not only were we taking risk, but more importantly, everybody we interviewed <laughs> was taking a risk. So I said to Beatrice, I just don't see the point of this, because actually we're writing all this stuff, and it, you know, Mugabe is still there, it's not making any difference. And she said to me, if people like you don't write about what people like me are doing, what's the point of what we're doing? Which made me think. For many of us, particularly women um, correspondents, uh, heroine is Martha Gellhorn. And in her book, The Face of War, she wrote, when I was young, I thought of journalism as a guiding light. I think I imagined public opinion as a solid force, something like a tornado, always ready to blow on the side of the angels. My colleague Marie Colvin addressed a memorial service at St Bride's two years before her death and said something similar. We can and do make a difference in exposing the horrors of war and especially the atrocities that befall civilians. The real difficulty is having enough faith in humanity to believe that enough people, be they government, military or the man in the street, will care when your file reaches the printed page, the website or the TV screen. Sometimes that's hard when tyrants like Assad stay in power despite or perhaps because of all the terrible things that they have done. We actually have in the room tonight um, a very brave um, journalist from Syria who was in Aleppo when Aleppo was being bombed by Assad's forces and uh, he I was spoke to him almost daily during that, and he filed somehow photographs and stories to us at the Sunday Times about life there. He's, are you going to stand up? <laughs> Here is a live example of courage. <laughs> um, Thanks. Uh, and it's because of people like him taking that risk that we know what's happening. And Assad might still be there, but we have to have faith that in the future he will be brought to justice and that what we do will make a difference, if not now, at some point. I will never forget interviewing a Yazidi girl who was kept as a sex slave in I Iraq and then Syria by ISIS. And she was telling me about how hard her life was and her captor at one point was this fat ISIS judge and she said to me the worst night of her life, she was just 16 when she was taken, the worst night of her life was when he brought back a 10 year old girl and raped her all night in the room next door as she heard her crying for her mother. Now this girl's story was so harrowing and so difficult to tell I kept asking her, are you sure you don't want to stop? Are you sure you really want to, to tell this story? And she said to me, no. And she insisted, I don't want people to ever be able to say we didn't know. Thank you very much. Christina, thank you so much <coughs> for that. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure how to follow that, but thank you. And um, thank you for everything you do as well, because you are one of those journalists who is out there on the front line. Um, and it's, uh, the bra you've highlighted the bravery of the people telling you their stories, but there's also a lot of bravery in those who um, file the copy and get the stories onto the printed page. So um, thank you very much. Um, as the evening draws to a conclusion, I just wanted to express um, a few words of thanks First of all, to all of you for being here this evening, um, to all of our judges, um, and in particular, to all of the journalists in the room. At uh, Daphne Karuna Galizia's funeral, in his homily, the Archbishop of Malta told journalists, never grow weary in your mission to be the eyes, the ears, and the mouth of the people. <coughs> given everything we've heard, Given the number of journalists in this room, I'm sure I speak for us all when I say we echo that sentiment tonight. Please do um, stay for a while this evening. We have drinks, we have canapes. We would love you to stay and enjoy our hospitality. You're all very welcome to do so. Um, thank you very much. Good night.